Okay, so the medical school is now on lockdown uh, because of coronavirus 19 and we're no longer doing face-to-face -face teaching at the moment. Unfortunately, that does cause a slight problem for clinical skills uh, and today we were supposed to be doing the breast examination. So we've attempted to take our teaching online um, and we'll see how we do. I'm hoping that um, we should have um, my lectures either appearing here or, to be honest, replacing me completely. After all, this is a face for radio. Um, and we'll hopefully make sure that you get all of the information you need to understand about the breast examination. So what are we actually going to be covering today? Well, first off, we want to make sure that we are equipping you with the knowledge how to do a breast examination. That means that you're going to be able to do it in a confident style with no embarrassment to yourself, which then may make the patient more conscious of what they've come in for. Uh, we're going to make sure that you understand the relevant information on a breast history, know the techniques for inspection and palpation of the breast tissue, know the location and the correct examination of the breast lymph nodes and recognize different breast pathological signs when you come up to them. Okay, so the first thing I want to make really, really clear today is words have power. And what I mean by that, during a breast examination, I don't want to hear you using the word feel. You don't feel anything. When I was at uh, UHCW under one of the breast surgeons, feel was a banned word in his clinic because unfortunately it's an emotive word. So when doing the breast examination, you can examine, you can palpate, you can inspect, you can check, you can even press over, but not use the word feel. That way we're going to keep a highly professional environment. One of the reasons that I am so, so passionate about making sure that this um, particular examination is taught well is it means that you can actually save a life potentially. You know, half the country has breasts and by making sure that you know the signs and symptoms and history to a good breast exam, it's going to mean that if you come across a relative, a friend or a patient, you're going to be able to give them the correct advice so that they may be able to do a self-examination themselves or more likely go and seek help from their GP with something that they were on the borderline with. You know, should I go or should I not? So hopefully we're going to give you all of that that you need. One of the things that's important to remember with a breast examination, as is for genital examinations, frequently they are sidelined or people try to avoid them where possible because there's some embarrassment to them theoretically, but you'll find that's actually embarrassment on the side of the medical student. You know, the patient's got no problems with it at all. That's what they're there for. So it's making sure that we've established the history, we understand what the examination is going to go through. Once we've got that set and we're, we're in our head that we think we've got a breast problem here and we need to do the examination, you must make sure that you get yourself a chaperone for that so that it's well documented and that you are protected as well as the patient. And I, I can't underline this enough. As a medical student and even as a junior doctor, um, it can be quite... Um, embarrassing for you to have to do a breast examination and part of that is lack of familiarity with the examination. I'll guarantee you that you are going to be more uh, nervous um, than the patient is going into that examination because the patient has already had to go through those mental hoops, that gymnastics, to come to you in the clinic that day, to come to you in the GP practice. They know that they've got a, a problem or they're worried that they have a problem with their breasts, so they're expecting that examination. But with all of that said, the big word with a breast examination is dignity, dignity, dignity. We're wanting to make sure we're reassuring the patient, wanting to make sure we're covering the patient appropriately before we do the examination and making sure that they have time and space to change into and out of their clothing so that they're feeling comfortable and that there's no sense, um, there's no possibility that their dignity could be impaired here. So once we've covered ourselves with those caveats before we even get in the headspace of doing an examination, we need to make sure that we've done a good history to understand what's going on with the patient. And the first bit about that is going to be how old's the patient. The older you are, the more likely it is we're going to be talking about problems with the breast in terms of cancer. 
However, the younger we are, it's more likely those are going to be due to acute hormonal changes, probably cyclical breast changes to do with a variation in um, hormones across the uh, menstrual period. We then need to make sure that we get the history of the lump. How long has the patient had it? You know, what changes came up um, with the lump, if anything else? How did they come across this lump? Was it something they found themselves? Was it something a partner found? Is it something they haven't actually been able to feel, but their partner said that they're aware of it? Has it been picked up on a routine mammogram? So that is going to give us an idea of time frames. Sometimes patients get quite worried about lumps and will delay coming to the practice. I've personally been really quite saddened when I saw an elderly lady who um, had come to the practice finally because of pain in her breast and she'd been terrified for months and months that she might have breast cancer and so she delayed coming. And when we actually did the examination and checked her breasts, you know, we got a nasty fungating tumour that was coming out of her skin. So finding out how long things have been going on for is a, a crucial question for you to ask. Another one that's useful is, have they had previous lumps? You know, lots of women have problems with their breasts in terms of lumps that come and go across their cycle. So a patient with a lump in that situation is probably going to be less worried than a patient that's never had issues with lumps before. And if you find a patient that has had problems with lumps, what was done about it? Is it something they've had monitoring and this is their follow-up? Or have they actually had a lumpectomy? Has that lump been removed in the past? And what information did we get on histology if the patient is aware? Hopefully they're going to tell you it's benign, but the patient may not have that information yet even. We want to know, as well as the lump that they've found, are there any other changes? Have they seen problems with the nipple? Have they seen changes over the skin? And crucially, is there any pain in the breast? That can, um, in patients who aren't having cyclical breast pain, be um, a good uh, warning flag that something's going on. Cyclical breast pain, however, is normal, and we're not going to be too concerned about that from a breast cancer perspective. Obviously, it's very important to treat anything that's affecting the patient's quality of life, but from a worrying perspective in terms of something nasty underlying it, cyclical breast pain wouldn't give us too much concern. We're very lucky in the UK, given the wide access to uh, breast screening that women have here. So that's another good question in our history. When did the patient last go for breast screening? And are they a regular attender? Do they normally go along to um, every opportunity that they're offered? And if they haven't, why have they missed those crucial appointments? Is there a fear? Is there a previous family history? So if somebody is doing something you might think is unusual, you know, why are they missing something that is supposed to be there to help them? Try and dig into that and find out. Maybe there's an issue with the biopsychosocial um, aspects of how the patient is viewing uh, their health. What medication is the patient taking? And here I'm particularly interested to know about HRT and or the use and duration of uh, the combined oral contraceptive pill, uh, both of which can have impacts on breast cancer. What's their employment? You know, are they doing anything that may increase their risk uh, of breast cancer? You know, do they get exposed to radiation, any chemicals, anything like that? And this is going to link well into our final big question, you know, what risk factors are they um, aware of? They may not be aware of them, but we need to also ask the risk factors that we know we need to check off doing a breast history. So speaking of risk factors, okay, there are 11 um, strong or you know, important risk factors to have a chat about. So I'm going to give you guys um, a minute to think of some potential risk factors for uh, breast cancer. Okay, you've got 10 seconds left. How many more can you write down at home? Okay, that's time. So let's start off on my list and see how we've done. So there's our 11 bullet points. And number one on the list, these aren't in a particular order, they're just how I thought of them. Is a patient taking HRT? And we know that HRT, because it's giving more exposure of the breast tissue to oestrogen after it would have normally uh, faded away, will increase your risk by about double compared to the uh, normal population. 
If you've got early uh, menarche, so your first period, and or late uh, menopause, can you see that increases the duration of time that a patient is exposed to oestrogen for? So again, giving more cycles to the breast and the greater likelihood that one of those changes could result in a malignant uh, cell forming. Null parity, so not having had any pregnancies at all or a late first pregnancy. The reason that this is important is that pregnancy is protected. Think back to what I was saying about that cyclical change. If you have a baby, you're pregnant for nine months, then potentially breastfeeding afterwards, that's vastly increasing the time where you're not getting that cyclical change in the breast across the month. So having multiple children uh, is again protective. And if you want to look at it as a classic scenario, theoretically nuns uh, not having any children are at an increased risk of breast cancer. Being female, now that might seem like a daft thing to put on the list, but men can get breast cancer as well. So being female is probably the biggest risk in terms of developing breast cancer. So previous breast cancer itself, that in quadruples your risk. And it kind of makes sense. If you've had cancer once, that does suggest that there is something in your system that's putting you at risk of having it again. When we think about having had cancer, cancers you know, may run in families, and family history is a really strong, strong um, factor that we need to be aware of in our breast cancer history. In fact, it's so strong we're splitting it depending on who has been affected. So if you've got one family member under the age of 50, that doubles your risk. If you're unlucky enough to have two family members, that's going to quadruple your risk. If we've had more than three, then I run out of fingers because you have 12 times the increased risk. So can you see how some of these stack? So if you take HRT as well, that's going to further amplify all of these risks. So genetics do obviously play a risk, and we are aware of some specific um, markers associated with breast cancer. So having BRCA1 or BRCA2 is associated with you know, um, a 50 to 80% increased risk of breast cancer if you have either of those. However, BRCA2 actually seems to be the greater um, uh, worry for people because that also greatly increases your risk of ovarian cancer as well. BRCA1 still will increase your risk, but not to the same degree that BRCA2 does. And if you're a chap, remember AU can be at risk of breast cancer, but not only that, BRCA2 increases the chap's risk of getting prostate cancer. So it's really something to think about. Um, maybe if you're seeing a patient with breast cancer, ensuring that they get genetic screening, and then if need be, taking that out further into the family. Low social status or low social economic class, and you see these are going to connect to the next couple of things as well. So obesity, because obesity increases the amount of um, circulating estrogen, that's going to connect with the HRT, that early or late menarche. And you can see it, breast cancer is all about estrogen, estrogen, estrogen. So why does alcohol increase your risk of breast cancer? Any thoughts on that? How can we connect alcohol to estrogen? So if somebody abuses alcohol and develops liver damage, the liver is important for breaking down and clearing out a lot of the body's waste. And if the liver is not functioning to the same degree, it also can't help with the turnover of hormones. So it's unable to break down the estrogen at the rate it normally would do, giving rise to higher levels of estrogen. That's why in chaps that are abusing alcohol and they get liver damage, they may end up with gynecomastia, so the male development of the breast, because of those raised estrogen levels. The final one I've got on my list is being Caucasian. Um, I don't specifically know why that increases your risk, but we know it does so. If we look at other um, ethnic uh, factors though, being of African-American descent, whilst that doesn't increase your risk of developing a breast cancer, whilst being African-American doesn't increase your risk of breast cancer, Having that descent does increase the risk of having an aggressive or later detected cancer, so it has worse clinical outcomes in the long term. Okay, let's have a look a little bit at the anatomy of the breast. So the breast is actually an enlarged sweat gland, essentially. 
So the breast isn't uniform fat tissue. It's infiltrated by glandular lobules, which are then drain any milk that's produced out to the nipple. And I say this seriously, you don't get a lot of exposure to the various types of breasts um, that are in the world. So it's very important that if a patient comes in with lumpy breasts, you're able to determine the difference between their normal lumpy breast tissue and something abnormal. So as a medical student, I strongly advise you, try and get some time in the breast clinic so that you have experience with the different pathologies and the different normal variations we have with regard to breasts. There'll be very few of you will get a dedicated breast clinic um, uh, section. So you know, make sure you swap with your friends to get in some clinic time there um, and hopefully maximise your learning and your ability to help a patient when you do actually come across one who's presenting with breast problems. Staying with the anatomy, we need to look at how and where the breast is. So we know that the nipple is found in the fourth intercostal space in the mid-cavicular line although that will go further down as patients age. The other thing that's worthwhile highlighting is that the breast starts uh, at the um, side of the sternum and actually extends all the way around to the mid-axillary line. But that's not all of the breasts we need to pay attention to. There's also a bit further up. This is the tail of Spence. And when you're doing your examination, it's vital that you also palpate over this area because it can get forgotten in an examination. And there you may get a cancer forming that you haven't found evidence of further around in the breast. In terms of assessing the breast and or commenting about what you've found, you need to be aware that the breast is split into four quadrants and you're, being, and you're going to use those quadrants to highlight where you've uh, come across any lumps or abnormalities. Similarly, we're also going to have to present about the nipple and the areola around it. Now, I'm going to go back to what I've said previously, that words have power. So when you start off your um, patient history and you find that this is going to lead to a breast exam, you must make sure that you gain consent. And the first thing for that is just going to be, so we've taken a good history and it sounds like there's a problem with the breast. So we need to have a look at that. Would you be happy with me examining your breasts? And I'd take that yes, no to start off for consent. Once they've said yes, no, I clarify what exactly it is we need to do. So in terms of looking at your breasts, that's going to mean getting you to undress, getting you to take your bra off, and then we'll have you sitting on the couch and I'll observe your breasts. We'll get you to lie back and we'll get you to position your arm behind your head and then I'm going to palpate over your chest. So I'm going to put my hands on your breasts and also into your armpit to see if there's any lumps and bumps in there. Okay. Are you still happy to go ahead with the examination based upon this? Hopefully the patient will say yes. And then the final bit, you need to say, I'd like to get a chaperone for myself. Are you happy with me getting that chaperone? The patient hopefully will say yes. And then you need to document that the patient's given consent for the examination and that you have gotten the chaperone. Also make sure you record the name of the chaperone in case you need to discuss things at a later date, you know, many months from now, and you've forgotten exactly who it was that was with you that day. Okay, so in terms of doing the inspection, we've gotten the patient to uh, remove uh, their top clothings first, and we just want to have a look at the patient as they sit there. We might see things that are obviously visible, like erythema to one side of the breast, so redness. We may see uh, an imbalance in size. We may see other changes to the skin. At this point, you're just simply using your eyes to see if you can see anything as the patient sits there. In terms of things that you might need to look for, um, as I've mentioned, the asymmetry, has this been a long-standing thing for the patient or is this new? Think about it, if you've got a cancer growing, something swelling, something taking on extra blood vessels and maybe uh, getting oedema there, you may be getting an increase on one side of the breast. Asymmetry in all ways is normally a, uh, a worrying feature. I want to see if there are any visible lumps. Can you see any swellings as you look at the patient's skin? What about nipple changes? If they're unilateral, again, we've got asymmetry there and it's something that's going to be that more concerning. Any prominent veins? Again, I've 
I remember to repeat myself, a cancer, it's growing, it needs to be fed. That might mean we're getting more prominent veins around the breast than uh, the patient has had before. Have we got edema to the skin? So you can get tumours that invade into the lymphatics of the breast, blocking them, meaning the breast can't drain as would be normal. When that happens, you get swelling of the breast and you'll get a sign called peau d'orange, which we'll show you some pictures of in a moment. Is the erythema of the breast? Now this could be an abscess, you know, as the patient got mastitis from breastfeeding and things like that. So there's no problem with treating that with antibiotics. However, any presumed abscess that you've given one course of antibiotics to and hasn't resolved, you need to investigate further to find what's the cause of that. And finally, male gynecomastia. Okay, so again, this is obviously a change that is going to be abnormal. That gynecomastia may be bilateral, but it's still an unusual feature. It's not that uncommon for teenage boys to get it, who then will have this feature resolve as they get to adulthood. But gynecomastia in you know, adult males is unusual and might suggest we've got liver pathologies um, giving rise to high levels of oestrogen. So it's definitely something I want to pay attention to. Once we've done the inspection, we need to get the patient to um, do a few movements. So we'll get them to put their arms up behind their head. As they do so, that will lift the breasts, and we may see any, uh, dimples appearing if there's a tumour that's attached to the skin, so stopping things moving as normal. Again, by putting their arms up behind their head, that also lets us have a good look in the axilla, the armpits, to see if we can see any prominent lymph nodes. After that, we're going to want to get the patient to put their hands on their hips and push down. This will contract the pectoral muscles and again might show us some changes in the skin that we can't see with the patient at rest, suggesting uh, areas for us to focus our examination on. You know, that pressing down might reveal a dimple uh, that would again be a worrying sign. So nipple discharges aren't unusual. You know, think about it. breastfeeding, you know, it's quite normal to have a nipple discharge, especially if the breast is massaged. However, it's wor always going to be worrying if we're getting a bloody discharge. As a rule of thumb, blood should only be in one place, and that's in your veins and arteries. If it's somewhere else, you need to think, what's going on here? And in a breast patient with a bloody discharge, I'm going to be very worried. Similarly, a long-standing discharge is going to cause me a degree of consternation, and I want to know more, particularly if that discharge is there without massaging the breast at all. And we're going to go all the way back to what was said previously, an asymmetrical discharge, I'm worried that patient is going to be seen in the two-week wait breast cancer clinic to find out what's going on. So there we go, we kind of reiterated that point. So crucially, you're going to worry if you can get that discharge without manipulating the breast. We've talked about asymmetry already. Sometimes it can be much more prominent than others. And you have to think, you know, why has this gone on? What's growing? What's caused that change in that breast? So we've assessed the patient visually. We've got a good idea of where we might have a worrying factor. Now we need to go on to actually palpate the breast. There's multiple ways that you can palpate the breast, um, but let's just walk through the setup first. So the patient's undressed on their top. We're going to get them to lean back at 45 degrees on the bed so that they're relaxed. At that point, we're going to have their hand up behind their head, and we're going to then examine the normal breast or the unaffected breast first. You can um, do one of three approaches. You can either do side to side or um, uh, vertically. You can then do a radius, so starting from the nipple and coming out, and some people will do a spiral round. Personally, I prefer the vertical side-to-side -side approach because I'm confident in my head that I'll start off with the tail of Spence and cover all the breast tissue. Whichever uh, approach you feel more comfortable with, um, that's the route you should definitely take. But when you're doing it, it's important to make sure you're covering those four quadrants and the tail of Spence as we've previously discussed. As you're going round and you find a lump, you know, discuss with the patient, is this the lump that they're talking about? Is there something else that's going on? And pay attention if there's any pain when you're doing that examination. Okay, so we've palpated, we've examined the breast, but 
We also need to check in the armpit in the patient's axilla. So the lymph nodes from the breast drain up into the armpit and because these are so superficial there's a good opportunity for us to see if there's any prominent lymph nodes that might indicate something sinister going on in the breast itself that we haven't been able to identify. In terms of the axillary examination I'm going to get the uh, patient to relax their arm completely onto my free hand before I start pressing around inside the axilla. And I'm going to highlight to the patient that pressing in on some of the walls there may be uncomfortable because I've got to push quite deep to confirm that there's no problems there with uh, prominent lymph nodes. In terms of how you think about the axilla, it's basically a tent with no base and we need to make sure that we've pressed and rubbed on each of those four walls so that we can say that we have adequately examined the axilla and we didn't find any evidence of lumps in there. Now I will highlight why that is really important. Even in men, as I said, they can get breast cancer and when we do a breast examination on a chap, which is unusual, we still need to examine the axilla. I had a patient who um, he had some lumps in his axilla um, and he thought it was simply due to a change of his deodorant and he kind of sat on it for a couple of months but these lumps were still there and they were you know, worrying him. They weren't irritating him and that's a crucial bit. Um, they're only on one side though. So he came into clinic and you see from the picture there which is uh, kindly given me permission to use, um, he actually shaved his armpit for me and we could see these um, lumps there. Now I couldn't find anything else worrying on the breast examination but these lymph nodes were hard which is always a worrying feature. Um, We'd done his family history, so we knew that he had two members of his family, uh, both his mother and worryingly his daughter had been affected with breast cancer. So we referred this chap on to the breast cancer clinic and unfortunately he was found to be positive and had a small tumour there. Thankfully um, it was excised um, and to the best of my knowledge he's still doing quite well. So if we've come across some lumps, we need some vocabulary about how to talk about the lumps. So we can look at what's called the four S's. Um, so we want to discuss the size of the lump, uh, the site of the lump, so where in those four quadrants, the axilla, the areola or the nipple did we find it. What's the shape of the lump? Is it nice and smooth and oval? Or does it look worrying and irregular and lumpy? And what's the surface characteristic? Is it a nice smooth um, surface or is it craggy? Um, you know, it feels like something's growing unusually. I personally like to use the four S's because they're nice and simple. Uh, we can also uh, use the comet uh, approach. So what's the consistency? Does it feel soft and fluctuant or is it hard or rubbery? So hard and rubbery, hard and or rubbery would be worrying features for us. Okay. Is there any oedema, any swelling around it? So we're thinking to the pole de orange again. What's the mobility? So there's something called a breast mouse or fibroadenoma. This is a benign breast lump and you press it and it sort of moves every time you sort of put your finger over to it because it's got this little pocket in which it can slide around. So a mobile breast lump is normally a reassuring thing but one that's fixed and doesn't move, particularly when we've gotten a patient to do their movements, um, that's always going to be a worrying thing because it suggests there might be a tumour growing somewhere and infiltrating into the other um, tissues, which is why it's fixed and non-mobile. Any erythema? I go back to the lady who was very worried and who'd sat at home worrying about having breast cancer and hadn't come in until quite late. Her breast was, you know, there was nasty asymmetry there and we got this big red fungating mass coming through the affected breast. But it doesn't always have to be breast cancer. Remember we talked about an abscess, so if we've got a red painful area, particularly if it's hot, we could be talking about an abscess there. Somebody's going to need some antibiotics um, which will hopefully get on top of it. I think that's a really good one to highlight. Whilst frequently we talk about breasts, we're thinking about breast cancer, not all breast pathology is a cancer, so we have to keep in mind the other things that can affect the breast. And finally, is it tender? Is that lump tender? That for me is always a good feature when examining a lump. But breast tenderness, one-sided, 
is going to be a worrying factor still. And finally, some lumps will transluminate you. Stick a torch on it and it may light up as the light comes through it. That suggests there's fluid in it and may be more reassuring because we may be looking at a cyst. So there's a good example of our erythema. And we talked about lumps. There's a good example of um, a patient with the, um, you know, the, the tumour is visible coming through the skin now. So we can use paste stick as a way of characterising lumps as well. Um, now we've said that there are changes to the nipple. So a big change to watch for is obviously going to be absolutely asymmetry. So something that is on one side of the body and not affecting the other is always going to be a concerning feature. Some ladies get worried about nipple retractions. If that's bilateral, we're not going to be too worried because this is actually quite common and often benign. It can be the sign that something is growing and infiltrating into the breast and pulling the nipple in, but as I say, that's usually just on one side. So in terms of things specifically to look at the nipple, we want to pay attention to retraction, any inversion. So retraction doesn't have to necessarily mean it's going inside out. It could be coming up to the side. Any bleeding, as we've said, bleeding should not be happening anywhere that's not a trauma. And any ulceration, like that lady that we had who'd been so worried. Now, there's another uh, specific disease that we need to be aware of with regard to the nipple. This is called Paget's disease. Now, some people, unfortunately, have eczema, so they've got an autoimmune condition that's damaging the skin. And you can get eczema affecting the nipple. However, it's also possible to get what's called Paget's disease of the nipple. Here, we've actually got a cancer that's invading the uh, nipple from uh, inside. The simplest way to determine between the two is, one, if the patient doesn't have eczema, I'm going to be worried. Two, if it's asymmetrical, I'm going to be worried. And three, if it's only affecting the true nipple and not affecting the areola or any other areas of the skin. So if that's the case, I'm likely going to refer that patient along to the breast clinic to get this um, reviewed because it could be the tumour growing out through the nipple. Now we've talked about peau d'orange and here are our pictures. So this is due to edema of the skin because we've got a tumour that's blocking the um, flow from the uh, lymph nodes. So with this peau d'orange, um, the skin swells, but the hair follicles remain fixed in place. So because they can't swell with the skin, we get this appearance of like this orange peel style skin. I think a final bit to wrap up for us is you know, male breast cancers. These are very, very rare, but as I've mentioned, I've personally seen a patient with these, and it's important that any change to a chap's nipple is treated as worrying. You know, and chaps tend to be, just because of how we are, bad at looking after ourselves. So we're more likely going to see a more advanced case when we're dealing with a male breast cancer. Visible changes to the nipple, perhaps in drawing of the skin, in retraction or inversion, and or possibly bleeding and crusting. Basically, if you've got any doubt at all about any breast pathology, whether it's a chap or uh, a lady, make sure you refer them in to the two-week wait breast cancer clinic. Overview of what we need to do with regard to breast examinations. Please have a look at the Warwick YouTube's breast examination video and you can see how uh, we'd actually go about doing those steps of the examination that I've mentioned. Okay, this is the first time that we've done one of these um, sort of recorded lectures. Um, heck, I haven't even gone to edit it yet, so I don't know how it's going to uh, work. But it'd be really grateful if you could put some comments down below um, so that we've got some time to adapt this um, if we have to do uh, more of them. From a clinical skills perspective, we've got revision sessions next week, so that should be easier for us to cover. Um, but I'd still really like to know your thoughts down below so we can try and improve these. Okay, on that, um, have a good day and uh, good luck with your revision. Take care.